Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Welcome. Uh, my name is Megan Hoyer. I'm the Director of Public Programs and Public Engagement here at the Whitney. Um, and it's my pleasure to introduce this afternoon's program, No Mistakes, Andy Warhol's New History of Cinema, a lecture by Jim Hoberman. So you might have heard that the Whitney has an Andy Warhol show on view. Um, hopefully many of you see, have seen it, and if not, um, we're open till six. Um, Andy Warhol from A to B and back again is the first retrospective of Warhol's work in the United States in 30 years. At the forefront of this show is Warhol's radical reinvention of media, of which his films are an essential component. In addition to a selection of films that are on view in the galleries, the exhibition includes a screening program that offers an opportunity to see Warhol's films projected in their original 16 millimeter format. I want to thank, uh, oh, and the program for the screenings, because there are many still, still to come, um, is in the vestibule. Um, uh, so if you, you want to pick one up on your way out, or they're on the list on the website. Um, and I want to thank my colleagues, Donna DeSalvo, curator of the exhibition, um, as well as Christy Mitchell, who assisted her. Um, and finally, I want to acknowledge the incredible work of Claire Henry, assistant curator of the Andy Warhol Film Project, um, who organized the Warhol screening program. So our understanding of Warhol's film work is due to critics like Jim Hoberman. And I get the sense I probably, this introduction may be redundant for most of you, but I'm gonna do it anyway. Um, <laughs> he has been writing about Warhol's films for decades, attending to them in the context of film history, both mainstream and avant-garde. To give just one example, um, in 2006, he reviewed Andy Warhol screen tests, the films of Andy, the Films of Andy Warhol, Catalogue Raisonné, Volume 1 by Callie Angel. Um, in that essay, um, which I'm going to quote, and, but I, and I think Jim might quote it too, so no, I promise this isn't a spoiler. Um, in that essay, he wrote, quote, marginal though Warhol's film production may have been, he occupies a central place in motion picture discourse. It's impossible to consider practitioners of cinema verite like Frederick Wiseman or provocateurs like Lars von Trier, the entirety of home movie, video, uh, porn, surveillance, webcams, and reality TV, or the nature of camera-induced celebrity without reference to Warhol's work. He has had a retroactive effect on film history as well. The Lumiere brothers, D.W. Griffith, and even Hitchcock, Hitchcock may be understood in some sense as Warholian too, end quote. Um, and it's that last provocation that I believe is also behind the lecture you'll hear um, today. Um, but the point I really want to make in quoting this is to say that this essay well, is um, on the screen test, which was entitled, You've Got Three Minutes, appeared in the London Review of Books, one of the many publications to which Hoberman is a regular contributor. And he has published on Orson Welles and Oscar Michaud, among other subjects in the LRB, um, and they're also part of today's lecture. Um, and Jim's books have also been reviewed in their pages. So um, it was a great pleasure to work with colleagues from the LRB um, to put together today's program, and I hope you all picked up a copy of their latest issue on your way in. Um, yeah, and I thank them also for publishing um, this, that great essay. So without um, much further ado, um, a proper introduction. Jim Hoberman was a Village Voice film critic for over 30 years and has contributed to the New York Times, The Nation, and Art Forum, among other publications. He is the author of a dozen books on film history, including Film After Film, or What Became of 21st Century Cinema, and on Jack Smith's Flaming Creatures and other secret flicks of cinema rock. Uh, his Latest book, Make My Day, Movie Culture in the Age of Reagan, will be published this summer. It's the final installment of his Cold War Hollywood trilogy. Um, and Jim also has a great history with the Whitney, um, as he, I don't know, you weren't credited as a co-curator, but uh, deeply involved in a wonderful exhibition in 2013-14, um, um, entitled Rituals of Rented Island, I, the longest subtitle you've ever heard, so I can't, I'm not going to recite it, but, um, and a contributor to that catalog as well. Um, and um, Hoberman has taught at the Cooper Union and Harvard University and is currently an adjunct professor of film at Columbia University. So please join me in welcoming Jim Hoberman. Thank you. Kind of nice being uh, counter-programmed, um, <clears throat> more or less against the Super Bowl. Uh, it, it's a term that uh, 
that the Warhol might have coined, Super Bowl. Um, one of the uh, most interesting pro bono jobs I ever had was serving on the startup advisory board for the Warhol Museum. Uh, part of our job was uh, visiting wealthy people in Pittsburgh and explaining that uh, Andy Warhol was the most important American artist of the 20th century. And this was something they seemed pleased to hear. Uh, I don't think they would have been quite <coughs> as enthusiastic if I had made similar claims for, uh, for Warhol's uh, film activity. Uh, <coughs> so let me uh, back that up. There was always in 20th century cinema an implicit promise of inclusion, the sense that the same movies might uh, hold both the mass audience and the avant-garde spellbound, if not necessarily at the same time. Uh, for some early filmmakers, mainly European, uh, the motion picture was a medium. For others, mostly American, the motion picture was a mass medium, the mass medium. Uh, Griffith and Chaplin were popular artists who saw the new mass audience as a larger version of the traditional theatrical public. Uh, <clears throat> and for a very few, that larger public would itself be a subject. For these directors, motion pictures were not simply dramatized stories, but consumer products that epitomized a particular system. Because their movies were, in essence, self-aware mass-produced consumer products, such filmmakers were, in effect, pop artists before pop art. When Lawrence Alloway wrote in 1969 that the communication system of the 20th century is, in a special sense, pop art subject, he might have been speaking of Orson Welles. Welles took the media as his medium. Prior to Citizen Kane, his Mercury Theater had entertained New York with high concept Shakespearean productions, including the so-called Voodoo Macbeth and the anti-fascist Julius Caesar, both of which interpolated film and radio techniques on the stage. Even more dramatically, uh, Wells panicked America with a faux news report uh, broadcast of H.G. Wells' The War of the Worlds. Wells would broaden his means of, <coughs> of address as an actor, uh, an orator, a journalist, a stage magician, and a political activist. But his first film, Citizen Kane, was an unrepeatable event. On the one hand, uh, Kane hyperdramatized the act of uh, filmmaking uh, the same way that Van Gogh or Jackson Pollock hyperdramatized the act of painting. Uh, on the other, thanks to its scandalous burlesque of newspaper magnet William Randolph Hearst and its adroitly fake, hence uh, world changing uh, newsreel, Kane shocked something that we would call fake news now, I guess. Uh, Kane shocked the nation's communication system illuminating it in a way that an animated lightning flash might reveal a cartoon creature's skeletal structure. Although it may not have been evident at the time, Wells was the first American artist to take the media as his medium, and thus the forerunner of Andy Warhol. As uh, Borges wrote of Kafka, each artist creates his own precursors. And so it is with um, uh, Andy Warhol, uh, I'm going to quote Megan now. Uh, Warhol's centra centrality is evident. You cannot consider practitioners of cinema verite like Frederick Weissman or the Mazes brothers or Leacock, Penny Baker, or provocateurs like uh, Lars Van Trier, uh, not to mention home video, uh, porn, surveillance cameras, webcams, reality TV, uh, and in fact, all kinds of camera-induced celebrity without reference to Warhol. And uh, whenever anyone approaches the limits of camera-based cinema, they necessarily encounter him. He was the first to place movies in quotes. And after him, the outer limits of the medium would be defined precisely by those little marks. There is scarcely any aspect of other people's movies that Warhol's did not call into question. You crave intimacy, Get Sleep, a five and a half hour montage with repeated close-ups fragmenting the body of a comatose John Giorno. Want more human interest? Try Harry Gedzaller. 
uh, 99 minutes of the eponymous subject balefully regarding Warhol's camera. Are movies supposed to move? How about Empire, the eight-hour fixed camera nocturne devoted to the flickering image of the floodlit Empire State Building? Crucially, Empire was a movie that didn't have to be seen to be, uh, uh, to be appreciated. Uh, you just have to have heard about it to get it, anticipating the current logic of Hollywood production in which the publicity tail wags the entertainment dog. The ambient, unwatchably long sleep in Empire might be considered the original film installations, uh, leading to um, Warhol's use of film in his disco light show environment, the exploding plastic inevitable, and here too. Uh, in fact, I think I, I should share the stage with one of these, uh, Poor Little Rich Girl uh, from 1965, Showing Without Sound, if you want to roll that. Okay, here we go. <clears throat> Warhol looked forward as he looked back. Scarcely had he begun making films in 1963 than his enterprise was understood to be recapitulating the development of the cinema, wiping the slate clean to begin again from Edison, who also made a movie entitled Kiss, uh, and the Lumiere brothers. Warhol made silent movies, serials, uh, and then graduated to talkies and cinema verite, his style, uh, even as he established his own self-conscious studio and star system. Warhol is, quote, traveling across the entire history of cinema, uh, close quote, his leading advocate and exegete, Jonas Meckes, wrote in 1966. Like Orson Welles, but in a different manner, Warhol reinvented film practice to suit himself. Unlike Hollywood screen tests, his were not made to audition, although these subjects who sat for him most frequently uh, would become superstars, notably the vivacious and tragic Edie Sedgwick, whose uh, image you can see uh, right now on my right. <clears throat> a screen test was literally a test. Warhol documented his subjects coping with the odd circumstance of total indifferent scrutiny. At cinema, the screen tests hark back to the first single shot, minute-long actualities made by the Lumiere brothers in the mid-1890s. Although, as was often the case with Warhol, the idea was in the air. Fluxus artists were already making similarly perverse conceptual films. Uh, a year before Warhol began documenting faces for the 13 most beautiful boys, the Icelandic political pop artist Aero was at work on a series of close-ups in which a succession of European and American art luminaries, Warhol included, got 15 seconds to squint, scrunch, and gape at the camera. There was also the example of Jack Smith, who with Flaming Creatures managed to turn all the limitations of outdated film stock, improper lighting, bad behavior, um, amateurish editing, uh, into smashing formal properties. And uh, Warhol's interest in Smith has been well documented, not least by Warhol himself. Uh, present for the filming of Normal Love, in fact, he's in Normal Love, if you've seen it and you know the wedding cake sequence at the very end, uh, Andy is there with a, uh, uh, not his usual wig, but some other kind of thing, uh, sort of dancing uh, after a fashion on the, uh, on the cake. Uh, so uh, he then wrote uh, or recalled, I picked something up from him for my own movies, the way he used anyone who happened to be around that day, and also how he kept shooting until the actors got bored. And in fact, Superstar is actually a, a, a Smith coinage that, uh, uh, that Warhol uh, uh, appropriated. But Warhol was also prophetic, the double image projection outer and inner space, partially shot on video in July 1965, uh, months before Nam June Pike uh, got his first porti, uh, Sony Portapack, porti dramatizes the distinction between film and videotape while introducing those issues of real-time recording and delayed feedback that would inform much video art of the 1970s. You might say that um, 
outer and inner space is a masterpiece of video art uh, made before the term even existed. Uh, but then Warhol initially used 16 millimeter film as though it were videotape. Um, in, in, uh, in, in the early 60s, if you opened the refrigerator of a typical underground filmmaker, you would probably find, you know, like a moldy, you know, uh, a hunk of salami and, you know, like a stack of, uh, of um, uh, rolls of 16 millimeter film. Warhol uh, didn't have to worry about that kind of um, uh, uh, situation. He just could shoot. And he employed an Oricon camera that recorded an optical soundtrack directly on the film and shot endless footage. And uh, I guess it's, it's uh, one of the uh, zillion ironies uh, implicit in the Warhol project that uh, Empire, which is completely silent, was one of the first, or if not the first, film that was made with the Oricon, the sound on film Oricon. Um, Indeed, predicated as they are on real time, Warhol's first films are uh, videotape of Atla Lecha. Uh, Warhol's screen test project and the early talkies like Poor Little Rich Girl, oh, she's up now, um, <clears throat> that developed out of them are distinguished by the artist's characteristic mix of the desultory and the rigorous. Maybe we should put it the other way around. The rigorous and the desultory, I think, would be more precise. Uh, <clears throat> Warhol's direction was strictly behavioral and sublimely indifferent, uh, which is to say that uh, beyond planting the subject before the camera, there was none. There was no direction. Uh, the screen test project demonstrated two essential elements of the Warhol movie aesthetic. The first was artless minimalism. Uh, making the most out of the least, uh, including uh, um, uh, Warhol's uh, effort. And, you know, I'm, I'm reminded when you think of that, that uh, of this, of what uh, Franz Klein's mother um, was uh, uh, said to have said to him when she saw his paintings. You know, she said, oh, I knew you'd find the easy way, you know. But um, uh, <clears throat> anyway, with these... Um, uh, the Warhol movies, you push the button and the machine did the rest. The second um, essential element was a zen-like acceptance uh, of that which occurred within the parameters of a particular situation as intrinsically interesting. So if Freud suggested that there are no jokes really, uh, Warhol asserted that there were no mistakes. And as a footnote, I would say uh, uh, that Walter Benjamin wrote some 30 years before Warhol that the movie camera, quote, introduces us to unconscious optics as psychoanalysis does to unconscious impulses. And uh, he's a Warhol exegete, you know, uh, 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 from the past as, uh, as, as well. Uh, poor little rich girl. Uh, shot in April 1965, opens, as you've seen, with a prolonged close-up of Edie Sedgwick asleep. Her image is not only motionless, but, as you may have noticed, completely out of focus. Thanks to ineptitude or a defect of the lens, the movie has the shallowest depth of field imaginable. And then, you know, um, haphazardly tracked by the camera, Edie takes off her dress, exercises, she bops, she fidgets, she ponders, she puts on a record of the Everly Brothers and hums along, she smokes, she makes phone calls, she sits for long minutes at the mirror amid the clutter of her toilette, but she only twice comes into focus, once by merely inhaling a cigarette. Uh, <clears throat> Edie uh, was the text, uh, both a, an object of study and a self-aware subject. Uh, indeed, Warhol was so taken with this 22-year-old ex-debutante, who was not only beautiful and full of grace, but also always on, that he conceived the movie as the first installment of a 24-hour epic that would reconstruct an entire day in her life, the Poor Little Rich Girl Saga. Uh, if the title sounds familiar, it's because it comes from a 1936 vehicle for Warhol's childhood Lucky Star, something you may have discovered in the exhibit 
uh, Shirley Temple, uh, in which the eight-year-old protagonist runs away from her rich relatives to join a vaudeville troupe, and as the Warhol scholar Callie Angel uh, noted, was not unlike that of Edie herself, who had fled her tragic, wealthy family in California to join Warhol's underground art world. And another thing about Shirley Temple, I would say, is that the part of her magic as a star was that there was no distinguishing between a, a work and play in her persona when she started making movies. It's quite miraculous, and I could see that being an inspiration to any number of uh, artists if they had thought about that. Uh, the first half of Poor Little Rich Girl, which we're looking at now, is pure myopic naturalism. Uh, you know, it represents how some of us, myself included, uh, see the world without our eyeglasses. Uh, it is also another Warhol specialty, an exercise in frustrated voyeurism. Uh, a girl dancing around her room in her underwear, whom we can only recognize by certain blobs of light. Now, <clears throat> getting the, uh, the film processed and discovering his mistake, uh, Warhol reshot Poor Little Rich Girl some weeks later this time in focus. But after screening the material, he decided to combine the first reel of his first version with the second reel of the second. And um, this was a, uh, uh, a, a, a leap uh, of, uh, of cinematic imagination, I would say. And so halfway through the movie, we're not gonna get to it, uh, there is a shock uh, form coalesces from chaos, and the blurry light condenses into images of fantastic richness. Uh, this movie first appeared in, um, in the context of cinema verite, uh, French for film truth, a, a new form of documentary filmmaking that really began to attract a lot of attention uh, in the mid-60s. It was a vanguard notion in 1965. It was not yet the province of uh, rock documentaries and uh, uh, PBS. Uh, it was founded on a, um, a democratic impulse in that the uh, uh, verite filmmakers uh, overthrew the tyranny of the omniscient narrator, something that you rarely get uh, these days, but used to be a, uh, uh, a cliche or, or, a, or a standard convention of documentary films. Um, also, armed with handheld cameras, which were new, and portable uh, uh, sound equipment, which was also new, they felt empowered to go anywhere. Uh, so on the one hand, the, uh, um, the Cinema Verite paralleled the Warhol enterprise by suggesting the possibility that the desire to make everything public might transform or might result in the transformation of everything into publicity. A great example of this, and unfortunately not an easy movie to, to find, is the uh, uh, Maisley's Brothers' Meet Marlon Brando, also made in 1965. Uh, here we have publicity about publicity, as well as performance about performance. Uh, a self-conscious and serious actor, Marlon Brando, installed in a New York hotel suite to flack Moratori, a mediocre World War II film, that he probably made, you know, for the, for the paycheck, is caught in a method acting conundrum. He is expected to play movie star, let's put that in, in quotes, but he wants to live in the moment, or failing that, to at least manifest some sort of authenticity. I'll put that in quotes also. Uh, thus, when one interviewer refers to his breakfast with Brando, Brando feels obliged to point out that it is actually 4 p.m. in the afternoon. Worse, the star repeatedly, uh, worse from the point of view of the studio, I would say, uh, <clears throat> if not the spectator, the star repeatedly draws attention to himself as a huckster. He explains that news is a commodity and says, we're all actors. He acknowledges that something's going on off screen and the cam he acknowledges the camera. He riffs with the film crew. He flags his own Freudian slips and interviews or hits on his interlocutors. In short, he gives an honest performance and even manages to, real, to reveal at some point that none of the junketeering uh, telejournalists who've been brought to interview him at a hotel on 57th Street has actually even seen Moratori. 
So it's almost a Warhol film, I would say, but not quite because uh, it, it was edited. If for it to be a, a Warhol film, we would have been shown the spectacle as it unfolded in real time. And uh, uh, would have, uh, it would have been an existential, even more of an existential adventure. We would have found that even more. Um, so Warhol changed the nature of the performative, or perhaps we should say that Warhol's camera changed the nature of the performative. Uh, the drama of watching Edie Cope um, with being uh, uh, observed here and in other films uh, illustrates a Warhol principle that whatever happens will be revealing of something. Uh, writing in the village voice, uh, Mekis made the outrageous but totally accurate uh, declaration that poor little rich girl surpasses everything that cinema verite has done until now. Uh, <coughs> astutely positioning Warhol as the heir to Italian neorealism. Uh, quote, it was an old dream of uh, Cesare Zavattini, the uh, primary uh, uh, theorist of Italian neorealism, to make a film two hours long that would record two hours from a woman's life minute by minute. Of course, this is something that Warhol you know, had in mind, although he wanted to do something that would even be longer. Uh, Mekis noted that presumably thanks to Warhol, cinema has been freed from the Hollywood regime. The filmmaker is liberated from what the Mekis called professional techniques, Hollywood subject matter, plot routines, Hollywood lighting. This is another way this, in which uh, Warhol has had a retroactive effect on film history. For there is an earlier American filmmaker who practiced just such freedom. His name is Oscar Michaud. And I think we can, we can cut uh, Poor Little Rich Girl now. Okay. <clears throat> Scene, or rather read this, Rediscovered in the light of, War, of Warhol, uh, Michaud appears as Warhol's greatest precursor. And I might also add parenthetically that driven as he was by necessity, Michaud's pragmatism exceeds even that of Orson Welles' uh, miraculously cobbled together European masterpieces, Othello and Mr. Arcaden. Michaud also reinvented movie narrative with minimal means to achieve maximal results. Years before Warhol, he approached mise-en-scene degree zero, creating a framework, setting up his camera, and letting nature take its course. You can also say that he provided dialogue. Uh, like Warhol, uh, Michaud was both an outsider and a quintessential American. That is a self-made man, a self-invented uh, personality. Uh, like Warhol's, his seems to have been an enigmatic personality, part trickster, part naif, impossible to say. Uh, although, and given his enterprising nature, uh, one of the things that Michaud did to finance his movies was sell tickets several years in advance of the movie being made. Uh, I, I'm sure he would have uh, appreciated Warhol's self-characterization as a business artist. From the perspective of um, formal invention, Michaud's uh, richest period coincides with the introduction of sound, uh, whose laws had not yet been, been codified, uh, as well as the absence of a Hollywood production code, not that it, he would have been um, subject to that, and the, pres and the presence of a presentational vaudeville aesthetic, which sort of came along with sound uh, uh, film. Uh, Warhol's early talkies also practiced a radical vaudeville aesthetic, and uh, like Michaud, uh, uh, Warhol created a parallel industry, uh, filming in his friends' homes at times, uh, and using superstars who didn't act so much as project their being. Uh, the Cuban filmmaker theorist uh, Julio Garcia Espinosa uh, began his 1969 third worldist uh, manifesto for an imperfect cinema with the notion that perfect cinema technically and artistically masterful, is almost always reactionary cinema. In this sense, uh, Warhol and Michaud are two radically imperfect filmmakers, which is not to say that their anti-Hollywoods are devoid of content. On the contrary, just as Warhol illuminated 
then repressed aspects of sexuality, exhibitionism, and celebrity, so Michaud directly addressed issues of race and racism that were strenuously denied in America's official culture. Uh, one might also see, uh, as I do, Michaud as the re refutation of um, uh, D.W. Griffith, uh, more or less systematically or maybe unsystematically undoing the whole film language that uh, Griffith had uh, put into place. Or to step into uh, the, uh, the Borges chronology, uh, you might appreciate Michaud as the Melier to, uh, to Warhol's uh, Lumiere. Uh, <clears throat> Michaud parallels uh, the Warhol aesthetic with his editing. Uh, Warhol follows Michaud in using a camera-based art to obliterate intentionality. When um, a uh, long unseen Warhol film, uh, but one of considerable interest for uh, uh, music fans, The Velvet Underground and Nico, was uh, uh, shown after many years, some years ago at Sundance, it was reviewed in Variety, and Variety's uh, reviewer uh, noted that, quote, as with Warhol's other films, it's impossible to tell where his technical ineptitude ends and innovative philosophy begins. Well, you know, I, I ditto that. <laughs> Uh, similarly, it, as, associates said of Michaud that he left his mistakes in to give the audience a laugh. Uh, both Michaud and Warhol make behavioral use of long takes. The camera grinds on. And in fact, in, in, in um, Michaud's movies, you can hear it. Um, you know, I guess, you know, blimps were erratic. Uh, unlike Warhol, however, uh, Michaud could not afford retakes. Uh, resulting in movies that could be space warping symphonies of unmatched inserts. Uh, like Warhol's, Michaud films essentially document their own making. His talkies frequently announce themselves as constructs. Uh, their soundtracks echo with off screen instructions, camera noises, stray car honks. Uh, in fact, he did something uh, uh, in advance, another, he anticipated Orson Welles in another way which is that uh, if he didn't like an actor's line reading, he was capable of like just dubbing himself in, you know, and, and throwing in a reaction shot, you know, uh, uh, to cover it. And um, if you're familiar with Mr. Arcaden, I think that Wells plays a half dozen, at least, uh, characters with the different voices and so on. He does that in, in, in Othello, too. Um, so, uh, uh, like Poor Little Rich Girl's catastrophic focus, uh, these mistakes in Michaud only expand the definition of movies, only make it possible to do more things, uh, only break rules that, you know, uh, were uh, uh, arbitrary in any case. Uh, as the, uh, uh, and you can find this elsewhere at times, as the surrealist cinephile uh, Ado Kiru put it, learn to go to see the worst films. They are sometimes sublime. Uh, I'd like to conclude with a brief excerpt from Michaud's 1932 talkie, The Girl from Chicago. It's only one passage in a movie filled with wonderful scenes, uh, but it's the one perhaps closest to a Warhol screen test in that it features a five minute two shot uh, with uh, Stark Halloway and Carl uh, Mann. Uh, a man, a uh, Harlem uh, school teacher who was born in Trinidad, appears in a number of early Michaud talkies. So if you're a Michaud fan, you will have seen this guy. Uh, Calloway, who I would, I would so like to believe was a, uh, uh, a cousin or somehow related to Blanche and uh, Cab Calloway, although there's no, no, there's no record of her um, <coughs> that I could find, is, uh, is making her first and uh, it would seem only appearance. Uh, and uh, uh, coping with the camera rolling and uh, having to memorize uh, Michaud's sometimes uh, um, hard to uh, 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 play uh, uh, dialogue, I think that she gives as haunting, uh, she's as haunting an ingenue as, uh, uh, for me as, uh, as, as Edie Sedgwick. So if we can just look at that, uh, that clip.
Surely, you have us all puzzled as to who you are and what you are. Really? Whatever it is, I know you're far different from anybody I have ever met. In fact, I had begun to think there were no such men as you. You flatter me, Miss Shepard, but you also interest me a great deal. Indeed, I, I hardly expected to meet anybody down here or anywhere else like you. It's kind of you to say such nice things, Mr. White. It's easy, because I know I speak the truth. You seem to sort of inspire a new confidence in me with regard to our girl. Now, uh, as to my business, I trust you'll appreciate my position when I say that it is uh, confidential. I can't say more just now. And I hope you won't even tell anybody that I've said that much. I know I can trust you. Of course you can, Mr. White. Why, I'll tell no one of our conversation. In the meantime, if you let me, I'd like to tell you something. Something confidential also. Yes, uh, by all means, Norma. I mean, uh, Miss Shepard. Norma is my name. You may call me that if, if you wish to. At least it is easy to say. I'll be glad to. But only if you remember that mine is Alonzo. Alonzo. Let's make it long for short. That is real easy to say. Fine. Okay, then it's understood that you're to call me Norma, and I can call you Lon when we're alone. But we'll be a little formal in the presence of others, say, for a week. How is that? Okay. But suppose I should forget and call you Norma at such a time. Would you agree not to be... Angry and scold you? I promise. <laughs> oh, I don't feel that I could ever be angry with you, Norma, or that you could be with me. This is getting interesting and wonderful. I feel the same way about you. Isn't it comforting to feel that way? Oh, I don't think I ever felt quite this way towards anybody until I met you. I seem to want to put my whole life into your keeping. Tell you everything. Do anything for you. Oh, Norma. Don't say any more now, Alonzo. Let me finish what I started to. Oh, yes, 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 go on. Well, it's about this man, Bellinger. I've been informed that he intends calling on me tonight. To call on you? Why, Norma, I didn't know that you... No, I never met him formally, but he saw me the day I arrived and spoke to me and offered to drive me to Mrs. Austin's in his car. And? Of course I refused him. I didn't like his eyes and the way he looked at me and will have nothing to do with him. Now, you've heard how he runs his town, and it's especially after every new and strange girl that comes here. Yes, I understand. And it's a rather strange coincidence. For well, I'm interested in Ballinger more than he has the least idea of. Now he plans to call on you tonight. Okay. Suppose we stroll back towards Mrs. Austin's now. And as we go, I'll, I'll try to think of a way to entertain Mr. Ballinger when he calls on you tonight. Let's go. Okay, and um, <clears throat> I have to say that um, I've seen that many times, and I'm always impressed by uh, uh, what I see as certain uh, improvisation that's that's going on. But uh, <clears throat> by way of summation, I will tell a brief tale out of school regarding my uh, uh, my own existential adventure as a member of the board of advisors for the Warhol Museum. Uh, one of one colleague, uh, indeed a former collaborator on Warhol's films, and hence, you know, an expert. Uh, expert witness 
in this situation, strenuously and repeatedly maintained that the early movies, uh, which were all those made before trash, uh, were an embarrassment at best. Uh, this gave me a chance to do a third rate and the imitation uh, when he next went into a diatribe about how awful the movies uh, were, I got to say, gee, you're right. And that's why they're so terrific. Thank you. Oh, yeah. If, if anybody has any, any questions, sure. Everybody can hear. Do, can you talk a little bit? Um, maybe you know uh, uh, the relationship between Smith and Warhol. This was a friendly relationship or a confrontational, or it was a sharing situation? Um, well, <clears throat> let me say that, you know, just to purpose, that, that Jack Smith tended to run through uh, friends. So I wouldn't call it a friendly relationship. And the other thing is that there was a people, you know, a downtown artists had, had a lot of ambivalence regarding Warhol, because you had a, a bunch of, you know, uh, uh, incredibly talented uh, people living in, you know, cold water apartments on the, on the, uh, on the, on the real, low, on the lower, lower east side, not, not, you know, and, uh, and um, some of them, and they were being scooped up, some of them, and brought to the, to the factory. Uh, and one of them was, uh, was Smith, who was, you know, after Flaming Creatures was certainly the most, uh, 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 famous uh, or notorious underground filmmaker until Warhol made, you know, Sleep and, and, and Empire and so on. And so they did work together on a film uh, which was never completed, which is referred to as Batman Dracula, which is not without interest. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> Smith also appears in one of Warhol's lesser movies, Camp, but he is, he is great in it. I mean, it's, 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 it's essentially it's a series of routines that people do. And when it's his turn, he walks, you know, first of all, it says this outrageous thing. He says, oh, Andy, let's go look in the closet, you know. And then he gets up and he walks around the, the, the factory and the camera has to follow him. And it's like, so he took, he succeeded in taking control of the, of the film. Anyway, he, uh, Smith also, you know, felt that people were ripping him off and not understanding him. So it was just a matter of time before, you know, he, he regarded Warhol as, as an enemy and, uh, uh, I'll have one last thing is that and go, going through the Smith papers, which I, which I did, there were, there were like about 17 copies of a script called I Shot Andy, you know, which, uh, so there you, there you have it. <laughs> Thanks, Jim. Great lecture. Um, was was Chantal Ackerman at all influenced when she made uh, by by Warhol when she made uh, Jean Dielman? Well, yeah, I mean, I think well, Chantal Ackerman came to New York around 1970, 71, and at that time the Warhol films were not being shown except um, Andine had managed to like extract his own prints, so he sometimes showed the films that that he was in, or they were shown. Uh, some of them were shown at anthology, and I'm sure she saw those. Uh, there and she also was was um, uh, influenced by filmmakers who were influenced by by Warhol. I mean, um, you know, the structural filmmakers may not have regarded Warhol as one of them, but certainly in his his radical um, simplification of, of of movie making, he 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 created a space for that kind of cinema to exist. So yeah, I mean, I would say she's influenced by by what was going on in New York. At the, at the time, and Warhol was part of it. Um, what were the Warhol's sets like? Like, uh, sets? would he like, like uh, operate the camera and direct? Well, or? there were, there are <coughs> there are <coughs> varied accounts. I mean, sometimes with the screen tests, he just like turned on the camera and went away. And, and the camera just filmed the person there. Some of the, some of the films he did operate. The camera, I think that I mean this is the kind of thing that Callie Angel 
was the person who, who did the most research on this, and um, she would be the authority. Um, but I believe that he did the, he operated the camera at Poor Little Rich Girl, but there also were a number of people who were credited with operating the, the, uh, the cameras. Some of them, it's interesting, he didn't really direct, but some of the movies have directors, some of the Edie Sedgwick uh, movies. I mean, she had a, uh, there was a guy whose name I forget, um, who was kind of like her manager, or he was like some, you know, he was, he was the same age, but he somehow thought that he could like get her, you know, like maneuver her into some kind of stardom. So he sits outside the, uh, the frame and sometimes tells her, her what to do. In fact, in, in Poor Little Rich Girl is one of them. But his way of directing her is taunting her. Um, so Warhol wouldn't have done that. I mean, he's, he, his, you know, his passivity in these situations is what, is what allows these things to, uh, uh, to happen. If you're asking for the locations, I mean, they started out in the factory, and, and that's where a lot of the films were shot, you know, in the, in the East 40s. But he also used people's apartments, too. In fact, I think this was Edie's apartment. Uh, where was the original factory located? Like, what's there now? Uh, it was 47th Street. Somebody will know. 46th Street or 47th Street. Yeah, it was, uh, uh, and I think it was, was it east of York Avenue? It was all the way, it was pretty far east in that um, I can, uh, I mean, this is funny. I, the, the way I know, I, 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 can, I can sort of visualize the block because probably in 1965 or 66, I was, in, I was you know, on a peace march <laughs> heading down to the, to the, uh, to the, to the UN, to UN Plaza. It must have been Second Avenue because, and remember passing by there, and they were like out there. The Warhol people were sort of out on the fire escape, you know, sort of thing, watching this thing go by. Uh, yes. Oh, you did. Oh, I got to know George and Mike Kuchar fairly well, but I never thought to ask them about Warhol. Was there, where, where would they fit in with each other? Well, the, the Kuchars were um, a sort of like little Mozarts uh, on the scene. I mean, they were twins from the Bronx who um, began making movies when they were in high school with an eight millimeter camera. And these movies are, are hilarious. And they got all their friends to dress up, and they shot them on the roof. You know, I mean, one of them said, he said, said oh, yeah, they were fat, but they wanted to be Marilyn Monroe. I mean, it's, you know, so they're, they're parodies of, um, of Hollywood movies, but also using the language. And um, their movies, they used to show their movies at the Amateur uh, um, Filmmakers Society, something that was a, a society for people to show their home movies. This is in the early 60s. And their movies were much too risque and, and funny. I mean, so they got, they got banned from that. And somehow, uh, uh, the filmmaker Ken Jacobs and another filmmaker, a guy named Bob Cowan, who had seen their films, um, introduced them to Jonas Meckes and to the underground. So the Kuchars are a separate development completely. I mean, um, I, I think that uh, <clears throat> I, I don't think that they were necessarily influenced by, by Warhol, but I would say that the Kuchars and Warhol and Jack Smith were, were, and Kenneth Anger were all influences on, on John Waters, who sort of, you know, like was the next thing to come along. I'm going <laughs> to maybe embarrass myself, but uh, I, I was curious about um, maybe the influence on global cinema, like specifically... Uh, was it like 1989 close up? Is it Kirostani? I can't remember the director. Oh, name. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The Iranian director. Hard, hard to know because I think that, you know, <coughs> once the once, as I said about about Empire, you didn't have to see it to get it. You just had to know that that somebody had done this and it existed. And you know, um, 20 years, 30 years after, uh, 20, you know, <coughs> five years after the Warhol films were made. There was, there was like, they were out there, in, those ideas were out there in, in the world. And if anything, I would say that Kurostami may have been influenced by Godard, but he, Godard also, although he would never really admit to this, assimilated uh, the ideas in, in Warhol and, and uh, Cinema Verite, uh, as I mentioned, has some of these ideas in an inchoate form.
So I don't think there's, a, to answer your question, I don't think there's a direct influence, but you know, uh, Kurosami is picking up on stuff that was, that was out there and doing his own brilliant thing with it, I, I should add. Hi. Um, how did Warhol talk about his own f films in, in comparison to how he talked about pictures from Hollywood? I mean, what kind of words did he use to describe them? Well, he would just say things like, <laughs> you know, people are so terrific, they can't do anything, uh, anything wrong. I mean, he, he developed this, this persona, which really was a persona, which is, it's hilarious to, to hear him, I mean, in the show, I think they have some, him giving some interviews to the media. I mean, you know, in addition to everything else, he also figured out how to do the, um, uh, the media put on. I mean, Bob Dylan is the other person who, who but, but, but Dylan had a much angrier and sarcastic, more sarcastic approach. I mean, Warhol was completely deadpan, you know, saying that he, he always wanted to be a machine. I mean, he would, you know, he would say these things which were completely confounding. You don't know what, what, he, um, what he really thought. And, you know, <clears throat> as he, he started making, continued making movies, his movies did become more normal and, to me, less interesting. Um, you know, it's this period um, when he doesn't, he doesn't really know how to make movies. He, he just knows how to turn the camera on and get the people and set it up that, that, they're, that they're, they're, they're most exciting. One, one, more. Uh, one of the labels in the, in the uh, exhibit says that, <clears throat> excuse me, after he was shot, uh, Andy, you know, came back as an artist and continued to work. But my understanding has always been that after he was shot, he never made another film again um, uh, it, of, of his own. And I'm just ah, wondering what the truth is. You're not a plant, are you? I mean, I'm so glad you answered that, that question because, yes, he did. He did make, I mean, I think that he made, he made several. I'm pretty sure that he shot Blue Movie, which was, which was banned, which is a movie in which uh, Viva and uh, uh, Louis um, Waldron, guy from the Living Theater, talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and talk and get undressed and talk some more, and then at the very end they have sex. So that was, I, I'm pretty sure he shot that, or at least he was on the set for that, and that's 1969, so that's after he was shot. However, there is another movie which is routinely credited to, uh, to Paul Morrissey, who did make a number of movies with Warhol, called Women in Revolt, which I've, I've done a certain amount of research into and spoken to people who were in it, and he did shoot that movie. And the interesting thing about that movie, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a parody of, I mean, it's his answer, in a way, to Valerie Solanas, because, you know, it's, 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 it's supposedly a comedy about feminism, and the three feminists are played by Candy Darling, Jackie T Curtis, and Holly Woodlawn. So, you know, they're all, they're all guys in, in, in some form of, of, of drag. And it's, it's actually, I mean, has a lot of, I mean, first of all, they themselves are all very, very funny people. So if they're making up their own uh, dialogue, uh, it's, uh, it, it's, it's delightful. But um, uh, it's, it's pretty evident that Warhol made this movie. And not only did he make the movie, he made it against the advice of his uh, um, you know, uh, uh, advisors, should we say? Who said that, you know, no, no, we don't want to stay away from this. Don't make a movie you know, that, that in any way you know, refers to, uh, um, you know, uh, the women's movement, you know, stay away from it, and he went ahead and did it in, in any case. So I'm glad you brought that up because that's, a, you know, that movie should be recognized as a Warhol film, and it's not. Yeah, you're well. 